This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight, join me for a special two-hour edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Some legends get better with time. Others become more and more real. Many people believe that the untamed forests of the Pacific Northwest harbor a mysterious creature known as Bigfoot. Now a team of researchers, bolstered by credible eyewitness accounts, has set out to prove that the fabled beast does exist. Since 1984, Bill and Dorothy Wacker claim they have been targeted in a vicious campaign of harassment. Anonymous phone calls, threatening notes, burglaries, and even violent assaults. In this most bizarre case, everyone is suspect, even the Wackers themselves. Christine Reinhardt needs your help to find her husband. He disappeared from a Colorado motel on August 31st, 1993. Two weeks later, he was apparently spotted on an Amtrak train, disheveled and disoriented. Christine is convinced that he is suffering from amnesia, that he has no idea who he is or where he lives. Are there angels here on Earth watching over us? You'll see the compelling accounts of the two women who came face to face with death and miraculously survived. Join me for this very special edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Mount Hood, Oregon, April 19th, 1994. The peaceful beauty of an alpine spring is shattered by a manhunt. Copy contact team. I understand your latest coordinates. We're closing in on the fugitive. 25 volunteers are on the ground. In the air is a helicopter equipped with a sophisticated thermal imaging system called FLIR, forward-looking infrared. Here's our target. But this manhunt is different. It's a training exercise. Even the fugitive is a volunteer, a stand-in, as it were, for the elusive, legendary creature known as Bigfoot. Bigfoot, Yeti, Sasquatch. No matter what this beast is called, many believe that if he exists, he is a missing link between ape and human. The training exercise was sponsored by an Oregon-based group, the Bigfoot Research Project. Peter Byrne, noted adventurer and world explorer, heads the project. We don't want to capture it. We don't want to shoot it. And the ultimate find, you know, as far as we're concerned, would be to do something like what Jane Goodall did. In other words, to find one, uh, see if we can communicate, have it lead us to others, and then bring in um, um, the right people, totally responsible people, bring in scientists and show them what we've found and um, document the whole thing, of course. Attempts to document Bigfoot have so far been sketchy. There are several crude home movies and videos purporting to show the creature in the wild. And there are dozens of plaster casts and photographs showing large humanoid footprints. Yet for every person who believes Bigfoot exists, you'll find at least two who say that the films and the footprints alike are merely the handiwork of pranksters in fur suits. Is Bigfoot real? Or an elaborate, ongoing hoax? Well, even hoaxes are usually based on something. Through the years, eyewitness accounts have consistently described a very human-like animal. He walks upright with an almost comical gait and steers clear people, 
unless they happen to invade his turf. But even those who claim they've run across Bigfoot say he's a harmless, if somewhat scary-looking, giant. Todd Neese is a sergeant in the Army National Guard. Once a month, he returns to the Oregon Coastal Range, where he had an unusual sighting while on maneuvers in 1993. Across a ravine, I could distinctly see three large black figures. I would estimate the largest one to be between eight and nine feet. The two that flanked it were a full head shorter. I tried to think if they were bear or if they were elk. And then when I saw them shuffling back and forth, I could very plainly see they were upright on two legs. And, and during that entire time, they were all three of them were standing on two legs. I don't think I would have ever told this to anybody had something very unusual not happened. Uh, I was approached by another uh, sergeant who had uh, walked up to me and, and said, Sir Nice, did you see what I saw down at that second rock quarry? And not to be made a fool, I said, well, I don't know, what did you see? Uh, he followed with, well, for lack of a better word, what I saw were three large, hair-covered big feet. It's one of our theories is that they are nocturnal, and that when they're seen in the daytime, it's a result of disturbance of some kind. In this, in this case, there was a National Guard exercise with explosions, and immediately after the explosion, three of these things were seen. They were seen by him, seen by another man. And um, he gave us a description and um, a very credible story. One month after Todd Neese's sighting, two women were driving on a remote country road 100 miles away when they had a much closer encounter. The driver agreed to speak with us in silhouette. We had just come around a bend in the road when I saw movement, and I slowed down for the anticipation of something crossing in front of me. And that's when it stood up. and moved across the road without once looking at us and disappeared. We couldn't make any sense of what we saw. It was very close to a human, but yet it wasn't. There was no visible signs of, of clothing, shoes, jacket, hat. There was no neck. The arms were very long and swinging with the movement. We had the opportunity of interviewing both of the ladies, and uh, we found the story very credible. And we saw some signs where something had crossed the road, and um, about uh, 300 yards into the forest, uh, there was a dead steer. And the few footprints that we saw that were very faint were going directly towards that dead steer, possibly with the intention of eating it. So do you guys want to come along with me up there? If you're going ahead. OK. okay. Yeah. Perhaps the most amazing Bigfoot sighting in recent years occurred when Elmer Frombach of Seattle, Washington, took his family on an outing near the Canadian border. Elmer, an electrician and part-time prospector, set off to stake a claim nearby. I had a 4x4 four four cedar post that I was using to mark the claim. And of course, I had all of the normal things like surveyor's ribbon and a compass and different items which would be used to lay out the claim boundaries. As I traveled into the upper areas, I was now about at 1,500 feet. And I noticed that the trails in this area were somewhat isolated with trees being snapped off and laid over the trail in certain spots, which looked as though they were strategically placed to block the trail off. So I laid the cedar posts down on the ground and went up the hillside uh, to where I could walk on the trails easily again. Elmer had just started to take a few ore samples when he suddenly realized he was not alone. As I walked around the hillside, the pounding seemed to cease for a short period of time, and then it resumed again, and I thought, maybe the boys are up here playing a trick on me. All right, you guys, it isn't funny.
I thought at first I had triggered an avalanche of some type until I saw a big black hairy mass right behind all of those rocks and twigs. And then I began to wonder, is this a bear that I'm seeing or is it something else? And at that time, I kept thinking in my mind, I've got to find a way to scare it. And I fired a shot above its head, and it turned just slightly, and then proceeded to walk down the trail as though I wasn't even there. And as it walked away from me, it took perfect human-like strides down the trail, only like a giant man. At that point in time, I thought the thing was probably gone but this thing had crouched down at the end of the trail and it picked up a rock the size of a basketball and was using it to bang against the other rocks. It again made a slight sideways turn just enough to see me out of the corner of its eye. I was scared and I wanted to get out of there. I kept running down the hillside and the thing was in hot pursuit the whole way. I was absolutely terrified. And I had a hard time figuring out how that thing could cover so much area, or if there were actually more than one of them there. Never been more scared in my life. The creature could have very easily have caught me if it would have wanted to. Why it didn't is still a mystery to me. I still can't understand with something that would move that fast, cover that much territory, why it had such a hard time locating me. Uh, I don't think it was a chase. I think possibly it was what we call a demonstration charge, if it truly was a Bigfoot that he saw. And it was simply saying to him, get out of here. You know, this is my territory. Accounts like Elmer Frombach's are invaluable to the Bigfoot Research Project. The project correlates all eyewitness data in an attempt to predict where and when a Bigfoot will show up next. Based on this data, Special infrared cameras are set up in hopes of photographing the elusive beast. But even credible photographs might not convince the skeptics. Noted anthropologist Darius Swindler wants to see tangible proof. And I'm amazed that through all the years and the various people that have been hunting Sasquatch through the years have not really found any what we call bone or dental evidence of the creature. Uh, that to me would be very satisfying. You can talk to people who lived out here 50 years, never found a dead bear, never found a dead cougar, a dead deer, maybe. But when something dies, it's eaten. Just as in East Africa, when an eight-ton elephant dies, in 72 hours it completely disappears. This is nature's way. I would still like to see some, what we call, teeth and bones. I, I would think it would be only logical to suspect this. That we might, by this time, would have found some more concrete evidence of their existence. Does a lost species roam the Pacific Northwest? If so, there are a lot of people who are very interested. Some, like Peter Byrne, want to find a Bigfoot alive. Others want a specimen dead or alive. The eyewitnesses we interview hope that the scientific community takes notice before it's too late. It's not just to validate what I saw, but I think it's important if these creatures are still out there that they need to be protected in some way, that they need to be uh, uh, understood and studied. There was no aggression at all in the animal, and I believe that it is up to us to protect it, learn all we can about it, and leave it alone. What I saw there was a living creature and not some figment in my imagination modern science hasn't absolutely proven by a dead object that this thing exists. But I tell you quite frankly, I've seen one. I know it exists, and there is no doubt in my mind. Next, a determined wife crisscrosses a country in search of her missing husband. Perhaps you can help. Imagine that you are a woman whose husband has gone away on a business trip. You speak to him the night before he is due to come back home. 
and you never see or hear from him again. What are your choices? Do you sit at home waiting for police in distant cities to call you back? Or do you try to do something yourself? Christine Reinhardt of Clintonville, Wisconsin did something. Today, Christine's search for her husband has become an all-consuming quest. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name's Christine, and I'm out here uh, searching for my husband who's been missing for quite some time. Uh, his name is Craig Williamson. I've reason to believe that he's suffering from amnesia and may have been on this interstate corridor and perhaps caught a ride with a trucker. And, and I'd like to put this up in your window if that's possible and be someone fine. might see it. Sure. Oh, yes. I, I really okay. appreciate that. Thank you very All right. much. Thank you. Christine's quest began on September 14th, 1993 in Colorado Springs, Colorado, at the motel where Craig Williamson was last seen. OK, Ms. Reinhardt. Uh, this is where your husband stayed in room 112. This is the washroom here. Uh, all the stuff was in here, and he had a book here on the sink. OK, this is the room he stayed in. Over there on the chair was his luggage. Uh, it was unpacked and open. Uh, the bed was made. Uh, looked like it was not slept in. Had there been any, um, like, signs of struggle in the room? No sign of struggle at all. It looked like uh, someone just left and walked out. It is now my pleasure as an ordained minister and by the power vested in me by the state of Nevada. Craig Williamson was nearly 46 and Christine Reinhardt 41 when they married at Lake Tahoe. It was a second marriage for both. And wife. And Craig, let me kiss your wife. Craig and Christine had known each other for only a month, but it was definitely a love match. Christine still speaks of their marriage in the present tense. Being married to Craig is it may be a cliche to say it's like a honeymoon, but it really is because he's the most sincere, caring, loving person. I think the thing about Craig that is most endearing is his caring and nurturing attitude toward me. He's just wonderfully supportive, and very loving. Craig and Christine bought a farm in Wisconsin, Christine's home state, and undertook an immediate renovation. They added onto the barn, installed large tanks, and began to raise an exotic and tasty African fish called tilapia. Do you have them on oxygen today, dear? Yep. Any reason? Craig specially rigged an old school bus to transport the fish. On August 28, 1993, Craig Williamson loaded up and set off for Colorado even though he was still experiencing headaches and blurred vision due to a concussion he had suffered four weeks earlier. If I tried to rub his head, he said, honey, don't do that, it hurts. And so I know he was still suffering from it because he would still, um, I'd say, do you have a headache? And he'd say, yes, you know, but he wouldn't admit it, but I'd catch him taking aspirin all the time. In Colorado Springs, Craig rented a car to use for business appointments. At 9 p.m. on August 30th, the night before he was to return home, he and Christine spoke for the last time. Craig was a 1,000 miles away from the farm in Wisconsin when he disappeared in Colorado Springs. The next day, his credit cards were discovered at a market in El Paso, Texas, 675 miles south. Two weeks later, in Juarez, Mexico, just across the border from El Paso, Craig's rental car was found abandoned. Once again, there were no signs of foul play. Detective Robert Johnson headed the investigation in Colorado. This is the area where we found the bus still parked when okay. we came out the day of the search. Uh -huh. And what I wanted to show you is some of the things that we found. When we got here, the bus that Craig had driven down here was still parked kind of along this line here, about three right. or four feet from the dumpster. Okay. 
I truly believe that Craig walked up to his rental car and that someone came up behind him and hit him on the head. And this is completely in, in keeping in character with Craig, is that he'd get up and wouldn't go in and say, I'm hurt, help me. He'd think, I have to get on with things. I, you know, I have to be doing something. I'm supposed to go somewhere. I have to get back. And he would wander toward the bright lights of the uh, parking lot and then the interchange. And he wandered off from there. Over the past week, Williamson's wife, Christine... Television stations in Wisconsin and Colorado covered Christine's story. Within days, a retired nurse from Montana came forward. When I saw him on TV, you know, I recognized him. And I said, that man was on the train that I was on. And my son said, are you sure about that? I said, yeah, I recognize him. Judy Inman believes she saw Craig Williamson looking dazed and disheveled two weeks after he disappeared. Judy was on a train traveling from Montana through Washington State, where Craig and Christine had first met. When he first got on the train, these two drunks, they just kept harassing him. I was just wishing they'd all three shut up, you know, so we could get some sleep. And they swam, and they swam all well, when he walked up the aisle, he didn't say anything. But there was something that he wanted. I got to get back to the fish. <laughs> he kept talking about this fish that he had to go pick up. And uh, he was talking about this big building that had these big, huge tanks in it where they kept the fish. How are you going to catch this fish? These two drunk guys asked him, well, where do you have to go to catch that fish, you know? And he said, well, you wouldn't find a fish like that around here. He said, in fact, you wouldn't find a fish like that in the United States. Hey, hey, hey. It's my jacket. Oh. Oh. I got to get back to the fish. That man definitely had something wrong with him. He was absolutely not drunk. And I knew he was not mentally retarded. There's a difference between someone that's mentally retarded and someone that's drunk and someone that has a head injury. And I knew that he definitely had some type of a head injury because I've taken care of patients like that. I knew that that was Craig. I knew it. And the fact that it was on Amtrak and it was heading toward the Pacific Northwest, I mean, I knew that that was Craig. There was no way anyone could make up the type of things that Judy Inman said Craig was talking about. I packed up everything that I would need, packed up a suitcase for Craig in the outside chance I would find him, and went to look for him. Christine set off on a six-week odyssey, paralleling Judy Inman's train route from Whitefish, Montana to Portland, Oregon. She photographed every train station along the way. On December 26, 1993, Christine met Judy Inman in person for the first time and showed her the photographs. This is another one of the train yard. There's really nothing much around there. It's pretty empty. Then there's this That's one. It, there. You think this is the one? That's the one where he got off. Because it was a, a small building? Yeah, it was small, and it was this color. That's just the one where he got off. Judy had identified Wishram, Washington, near the Oregon border. Christine believes Craig might have mistaken Wishram for Washougal, a town where he had lived in the 1980s. Craig's son plastered the area with this poster, but no new clues surfaced. It was absolutely terrible to drive back here after looking for Craig for the six weeks that I did. This place was so cold and empty, and everywhere I look, there you know, things remind me of Craig all the time. Today, Christine Reinhardt has no choice but to sit at home and wait. 
The farm is closed. The fish tanks are empty. But Christine will never abandon her quest. I can't give up. I will never give up. I will just constantly look for him until I die or he's found. I mean, that, those are the only two options. I know he's alive. And I know someday I'll find him. The trouble is I don't know when, and I just have to keep hanging on. The hardest part is hanging on. Craig Williamson is 49 years old, 5 feet 10 inches tall, and weighs 190 pounds. He has gray hair and blue eyes. This is television footage shot in Wisconsin in February of 1993. Some of these will be filleted out in our processing plant. Some will be delivered to the East Coast as live whole fish to the uh, Oriental market. When we return, a fugitive is captured thanks to your calls and the bizarre case of a couple targeted for terror by an unknown assailant. This is 36-year-old David Vieira. He is charged with the murder of his wife. On April 16, 1994, Vieira was arrested in Montreal, Canada. The 108th fugitive captured thanks to your calls. His long troubling odyssey began some 20 years ago on a small island in the Atlantic Ocean. David Vieira grew up on St. Michael, one of a group of islands west of Portugal known as the Azores. It was there in 1974 that Vieira married his 17-year-old cousin Alice, who lived in New Bedford, Massachusetts. David and Alice eventually settled in New Bedford. Within a year, Alice was pregnant. The marriage went off pretty good, like maybe I'd say about the first couple of months. And then, uh, you know, already he was already starting with her. You know, she couldn't wear makeup. She couldn't do anything. You know, he was very jealous, very possessed of my sister. By 1981, Alice and David had three children. As the years went by, David reportedly became abusive to the point of violence. They used to always say, uh, there's no other woman in my, you know, for my life like you are. And he always had threatened her that if she ever decided to leave him for anybody, that he would kill her. But we never took it seriously, you know. Alice and David finally separated in the summer of 1988. Alice enrolled in nursing school and began to see another man. But David Vieira would not let her go. He allegedly began to stalk Alice at work and at home, night and day. On July 25th, 1988, Alice was at home with her boyfriend when David apparently snapped. By the time police arrived at the scene, Alice was dead, bludgeoned, and stabbed 24 times with a butcher knife. David Vieira had vanished, and for nearly six years he could not be found, until the night of our broadcast. Our particular segment on that show aired our time uh, here in New Bedford, Massachusetts, at approximately 8.50 p.m. By 9.03 p.m., I was receiving telephone calls from Canada right here into my office with very good leads as to his whereabouts. With the first phone call that I received saying that they knew where he was, um, I just jumped up with joy and told my husband, I think we got him, you know, and uh, I couldn't believe it. it took less than 48 hours to apprehend him. Vieira had lived in Montreal for at least two years and was well known in the Portuguese community. He belonged to a neighborhood soccer team and was employed at a local fish market. Vieira's co-workers were stunned to learn about his secret past. For me, it's a dream. I don't believe the guy do that. I don't believe it. No, it's, nobody uh, believes it. No. That guy is so nice. So because we see the picture. Yeah. If we don't see the picture, he's exactly the, the man. If we don't see, we never trust. 
I've seen them apprehended and with handcuffs, and to me that was a sign of saying, thank God I can rest and my sister can also be at peace now that he's caught. Dorothy and Bill Wacker have lived in a small town in Ohio for most of their 48 years together. What time's Kathy coming over? She'll be here about 6 o'clock. Oh, OK. The Wackers are quiet, unassuming people who tend to mind their own business. Bill? Hardly the type to draw the wrath of an unseen enemy. Oh, my. Not again. All right. That's it. I've had enough. I'm calling the sheriff. On January 16, 1985, the Wackers' home was ransacked. It was a third incident in a campaign of terror that began in 1984 and continues unabated to this day. The Sheriff's Department? Yeah, this is uh, Bill Wacker. After nearly 10 years, Dorothy and Bill Wacker still wonder who and why. Well, as far as all this harassment is going on, which to me it looks like it's trying to force us to move, why should I move? Why should we move? Why should we be forced out by a kook? To me, that's what it is, is a kook. Uh, I'll not do it. I'll stay there, protect our own. July of 1985, after six months of peace, another incident. Dorothy was home by herself, recovering from heart surgery. Yeah? I, I'm really sorry to bother you, ma'am. Uh, my car broke down, and I was just wondering if I could use your phone. Well, where's your car? Oh, it's just down the street here. I, I would really appreciate it. Well, OK, I guess it'll be all right. Come on did in. Did anybody Thanks. come to the door? We didn't believe the worst of them, so we did what we had to do. If they wanted right. help or anything, well, we always helped them. Right here. Nice place you have here. You need me? I'll be uh, in the kitchen. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate it. He was very polite. So I had no qualms about leaving him in. Yeah, I need to get a tow truck. Right. Uh, right off South Theory. Um, he was talking on the phone, but I, like I say, I didn't pay no attention to him. I don't listen to people's conversations when they right. use the phone. Thanks. And he said, thanks very much. And thanks. that's the reason I thought he'd left. You're welcome. The next thing I remember, I woke up on the floor, tied up. I know he hit me in the head, and he hit me alongside the jaw. And finally, when I got over towards the kitchen window in there, and it was open, and I got the neighbors to hear me over there, and they come over. Bill returned home to find his house swarming with police. Fortunately, Dorothy was not seriously injured. She's all right, huh? Bill did discover that some personal possessions were missing. A 22 caliber revolver, an antique watch, a movie camera, and a radio scanner. In the dining room, the assailant had left a cryptic message scrawled in crayon. The words were cheaper, but well do. There's no connotation, or there's no rational be rationale behind that message that we can understand. This sketch, drawn from Dorothy's description, was widely distributed after the attack. The suspect never surfaced, but inexplicably, most of the Wacker's missing possessions did. Bill says that about four months after Dorothy was assaulted, the revolver turned up on the front porch. One by one, the other items also reappeared. I couldn't figure it out. I still can't figure it out why it was brought back. If somebody was 
steal something, normally they're going to, if they don't have any use for it, they're going to sell it to somebody else. And it just looked like this stuff was laid around till it was brought back. This is extremely unusual, if not very rare. In all my years in, in law enforcement, I have never known of a gun being returned after it was stolen. Meanwhile, the unseen tormentor had launched a new pattern of harassment. Hello? Sometimes he wouldn't say anything. He'd just breathe real deep. And then the next time, why, he says, I'll knock you in the head and lay you out and do this to you and do that to you. I was angry and I was scared. They've changed their telephone number several times, and whoever this is that's harassing them has come up with the number. How they found it, I have no idea. According to Bill and Dorothy, the phone calls never let up, and the mysterious assailant soon escalated his campaign. I would be sitting there watching TV or reading or whatever, and always after dark. And on the driveway side of the house is where it first started. They would bang five, six times real hard. I don't know, but I'm darn sure going to find out. Bill. Find out about all this guy I'm going to do. No, I've had it. I don't want you going out there, Bill. Bill. I'd rush outside. Never see a thing, never hear a thing. Never hear a car. Never hear a noise whatsoever. We got to the point that we figured that we needed some kind of security light outside in the front, which we put up. It wasn't too long after that that we had a note on the front porch that says, your lights are a laugh. Periodically, other notes have shown up on the Wacker's front porch. Some are crudely threatening, others simply mocking. It was a disturbing onslaught, but at least the Wackers had tangible evidence Bill? to present to the authorities. Bill! It would appear that the person that uh, wrote these notes may have been using the opposite hand from what they're normally used to writing with. Uh, that whoever printed them uh, went to some pains to try to conceal their normal handwriting or printing techniques. Uh, to date, we have found no latent fingerprints or any other form material on the evidence that's been submitted. With the investigation stalled, Dorothy and Bill were seemingly at the mercy of their unknown enemy. He struck again on October 27th, 1993. This time, Dorothy was raced to the hospital with skull lacerations. Desperate for a witness, police once again canvassed the neighborhood. Have you had anybody around your residence prowling around your residence looking in the windows uh, in the last few months, sir? Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea who may be prowling around the Wacker residence? We've interviewed the neighbors oh, on, on numerous occasions, and none of the neighbors have yet been able to provide us with any information which would lead us to believe that there was a person there. Uh, nobody has ever seen anybody, uh, which is that's very frustrating to us in our efforts. With no suspects and no clues, the lead detective presented Dorothy with an unthinkable scenario. He says, I'm going to ask you a question, but uh, he says, I don't want you to take it the wrong way. He says, do you think your husband could have done this? And I said, no way. I said, he wouldn't do something like that. He says, we got to explore all possibilities. She says, no. Which, <laughs> why should I do something like that after being married 48 years, you know? In any type of criminal activity, usually you can identify pretty much up front what the motive is. It's pretty simple. Uh, the problem with this is you cannot identify the motive. You can't identify the reasons behind the activity that's going on out there. There seems to be there seems to be a pattern of activity, yes, 
but what is the underlying reason that this activity is taking place? The other thing is it's sporadic. It's not constant. You'll have months go by with absolutely nothing happen, and then you'll have a flurry of activity for maybe a period of a month, and then it, beco it becomes dormant again. Uh, this has thrown us into a quandary because we can't figure out exactly what's going on. We know what's going on. They're filing the complaints and they're filing the reports. We're going out there, but yet we can find nothing. In November of 1993, Bill and Dorothy took matters into their own hands. With the help of family members, the Whackers staked out their own house. Bill was holed up in a trailer parked in the driveway. Across the street, his sons-in-law, Dan and Clay, watched from a van. Clay's wife, Kathy, stayed with Dorothy in the house. The family was linked by walkie-talkie. Yeah, it's all quiet in here. For almost it? four hours, they waited. Around 10.30 p.m., they decided to call it a night. And uh, all of a sudden, why, we heard bump, 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 bump. Clay, Clay, I said, something on the front porch. No, I can't see anything. Inevitably, perhaps even predictably, the intruder had found a blind spot in the Whacker's stakeout. And a note on it. I never saw it come from anywhere. The scroll was all too familiar. The note read simply, get the message. Oh, my. Yeah. Uh, come on, let's go in the house. Violent assaults, threatening notes, unnerving calls, nearly 10 years of harassment. Who is behind the plague on the Wacker household? Could it be an embittered neighbor? A family member, a total stranger. The Whackers remain as mystified today as when their troubles first began. The sooner he's caught, the better off a lot of people are going to be. Because if he's not harassing us or threatening us, he'll probably be doing it to somebody else to get his kicks. I think that's what it boils down to. He gets a heck of a big kick out of it. Next, authorities need your help to find a deadly arsonist. September 29th, 1988. Arson investigators sift through the ashes of a burned-out home in South Oak Cliff, a section of Dallas, Texas. Five children had died as a result of the fire, and the authorities wanted to know why. The house belonged to a woman named Molly Jordan. The victims were her great-granddaughter, two-year-old Jasmine, and four of her grandchildren, Jamal, six, Erica, nine, Bernard, 16, and 18-year-old Demetra, Jasmine's mother. No, September 28th seemed at first like any other day in the Jordan household. By 3.30 that afternoon, the kids were all home from school. Their grandmother, Molly Jordan, was about to leave. Molly worked back-to-back eight-hour shifts as a nurse to support the six children. Molly's jobs would keep her away for some 16 hours until 7 the next morning, but she carried a beeper so the kids could reach her directly at any time. Around 3 a.m., Ketrick Jordan, then 10 years old, awakened to the sound of his brother Bernard talking to someone. Bernard had apparently become deeply involved with a local drug dealer. I was walking to the refrigerator, and I saw him, I saw the drug dealer and Bernard talking about, where's my money? And Bernard said, I don't know what you're talking about. Bernard. Chetrick, get back to bed. But I was just and don't to... come back out. The brief exchange left Ketrick shaken, afraid to go back to his own bedroom. So I went into my sister's room, and I went to bed. 
it seemed like I didn't sleep that long, but about seemed like about five minutes later, he can't. He was he busted into the door, and told my the house was on fire. The house is on fire. The house is on fire. Everybody got to get up. The house is on fire. Fire! Fire! No, break the window. Break the window. He told me to start busting out windows and stuff to try to, you know, get air coming through the house because we couldn't go through the front door. The only hope of escape was through the windows, but the safety releases for the burglar bars inexplicably jammed and refused to budge. I saw my sister, Erica, laying on the bed crying, and I tried to save her so she can get air, but she was in such a panic. And uh, then my sister, she uh, was busting out the windows, and she cut herself real bad, and she got into a panic. And I looked, I looked over to my little brother, Jamal, and he was already dead. And I looked over to my, my niece, Jazz, she was already dead. By the time firemen arrived, flames had engulfed much of the house. All six children were trapped. Repeated attempts to break down the front door failed. Inside, a couch had been propped against the door, holding it closed. The burglar bars doomed any chance of a quick rescue, and precious minutes dribbled away as firefighters fought their way through the iron. Ten minutes later, the bars gave way. Firemen didn't know if anyone was still alive inside. While parts of the house continued to burn, they began searching for survivors. They found Ketrick Jordan first. Ketrick was burned over more than 75% of his body. Demetra Jordan was also pulled out alive, but she would die the next day at the hospital. The bodies of the other four children were found huddled together lifeless at the foot of the barred window. At that very moment, Molly Jordan was rushing home from the hospital. She had been called by a relative who said only, the children are all gone. When I got about a mile or something from the house, I saw one ambulance passed me and they were just screaming and going. Then I started feeling sick in the stomach. Then I was thinking, well, it didn't have to come from my house. There's a lot of houses up. But when I got within a few blocks, it was another one past me screaming and hollering. And I just got real sick of the stomach, heart with the beating face and all this. It seemed like I couldn't breathe, I couldn't walk, I couldn't stop, I couldn't talk. Just everything left my body, it seemed like. Once the flames were extinguished, arson investigators easily determined that the deadly fire had been deliberately set. In the main living room, we found a gasoline can that had been there during the fire. And later on during the investigation, we actually did find samples of flammable liquids that had been poured on the floor and set on fire. Investigators soon pieced together what they believe are the events that led up to the fire. The drug people had come to seek payment from Bernard. Wanted him to come outside. He did not come outside. They set the house on fire to get him to come outside, but unfortunately, the whole family got caught in the burger bars and didn't come out. So we have an act of arson that resulted in five murders and one severe injury. Police now believe Bernard piled up furniture in a desperate attempt to keep the assailants out of the house. Instead, both the couch jammed against the front door and a love seat wedged behind the hallway door trapped the children in the house. The arsonist probably entered through this window, one of two not equipped with bars. We worked quite hard to try to find who was responsible for the fire. We did come up with one name, one of the individuals that was supplying the drugs to Bernard. His name was Curly, the nickname Curly. He was a black male, about 5'10 in height, made about 160 pounds. We never have found Curly or any of his friends, but Curly is known to have bragged about setting the fire. 
Three days after the tragedy, some 2,000 people gathered at Carver Heights Baptist Church to mourn the loss of the five Jordan children. In the five years since, Ketrick Jordan, the lone survivor, has endured a dozen operations, including the amputation of both legs. Ketrick is now 16. Prosthetic limbs have allowed him to walk again. After the fire, an outpouring of contributions from the community enabled Ketrick and his grandmother to move to a new home in a different part of Dallas. Do you believe in angels? Hear the incredible stories of two women who believe celestial intervention saved them from certain death. In California, police are searching for an unknown witness who may have vital information about the murder of a deputy sheriff. And two poignant stories of lost love. In one, a woman battling a fatal illness hopes to find her long lost sister. In the other, Brenda Abbey's search for her birth parents has taken her into the unfamiliar world of the traveling carnival. Do angels dwell among us? More than a thousand years ago, St. Augustine wrote that every visible thing in this world is put in the charge of an angel. Even today, most of us hope those words are true. You're about to meet two women, both of whom are certain that they were placed in the charge of a guardian angel just when they needed it most. Consider first the case of Janie Shamel. Her story begins in 1976. Janie had just turned 14 when her brother and sister-in-law took her on a Western vacation. They traveled in a camper with another family and visited all the usual tourist attractions. However, one stop stands out. In the painted desert, something amazing happened. Something Janie, who is now 31, will never forget. I had gotten a new camera for the trip, and I was curious to get some good photographs. And I can remember leaning up against the guardrail, focusing the camera and thinking, you know, if I just got on the other side of this guardrail down there a little bit, it would be a much better photograph. As nearly as anyone can figure, just at that same moment, Janie's mother, Shirley, who had stayed home in Michigan, was sitting down to read her Bible as she did every day. I really felt that I was led by the Holy Spirit to read Psalm 91. And I began sobbing, just sobbing because I knew Janie was going to die. I didn't know why or how, but I knew she was going to die. Oh, ah! Alfred! Alfred! Janie's fine! Janie! She's gone over the edge! Where? Where did she go? Right over the railing. I can't see her anymore. Suddenly, I just stopped. I just stopped, and I can remember thinking, I'm so glad I stopped, and thinking, what stopped me? I was afraid, I was scared that there was no way I was gonna get back up to the top. I could not see the top. I couldn't hear my family yelling for me. I knew I had to be very careful or I would start falling again. As soon as I uh, had this feeling that Janie was going to die, I began pleading with the Lord to please don't let her die. And uh, there would be more than what I could bear. I continued to read Psalm 91. It said, and he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways and they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest your foot dash against a stone. And then a peace just came over me because I believed it. 
Janie? Alfred, it's Janie. She's back. Janie, you're all right. Oh. oh, Janie, what happened? I don't know. I fell a long ways. I don't even remember coming back up. Oh, well, at least you're all right. Oh, I don't know. I was afraid I was going to have to climb. I know I did climb. not climb up myself. Something strange had happened, but I just kind of was glad I was back up there. And We had talked among ourselves about calling her mother, and we decided that she could call her mother, but not to say anything about her fall, mainly because we didn't want to upset Shirley and we were so far away from home. Tell me all about your trip. Well, Mommy should have been there and seen all the things. But inevitably, once Janie was back home in Michigan with her mother, the truth came out. And here's what that looked like. And here's where I stepped over the guardrail and I fell down the slope. You what? Well, I just wanted to get a better picture, so I climbed over the rail and I slipped. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, oh, uh, she wasn't supposed to tell. Well, when did this happen? When we were in Arizona. You remember that night I called to tell you everything was OK? Well, it happened that morning. When Janie was telling her story, I really realized the whole magnitude of what had happened to me. Then I knew that verses 11 and 12, that the angels should bear thee up in their hands, lest your foot dash against the stone that they were the ones that brought her back to the top. When I heard my mother's story of what had happened that day and her feelings that I was going to die, I realized then that it was her prayers that had sent the angels that had made me stop and had brought me to the top of the canyon. How do you explain what happened to Janie Shamble? Even though Janie neither saw nor heard anything to confirm it, she is thoroughly convinced that she was rescued by an angel. Estella Vera of Riverside, California, reports an even more dramatic experience. Estella believes not only that an angel saved her, but that she actually saw him do it. On Saturday, March 30th, 1991, Estella and her two grown children were on their way home when they spotted an ice cream truck being robbed. Estella's daughter ran to call the police while her son rushed to help the ice cream truck owner. He and another man were already grappling with a large, muscle-bound assailant. I knew there was absolutely nothing I could do, and I saw my mother in the path of his van. Oh, my God! I knew she was in between the two, so uh, I think instantly I thought she was dead. Estella's left leg had been severed below the knee, and she had suffered cardiac arrest. At the hospital, Mingo and his father kept vigil. What did the doctor say? The first time I saw my mother after the incident, I could not recognize her. Her face was completely swollen and uh, we were just waiting for any word whether or not she would even survive. Estella, Estella drifted in and out of consciousness for the next several days. Finally, she awoke. He's OK. He's right here. It's good to hear your voice, Mom. Did you see the men by the truck? Don't worry, Mama. He's in jail. No. The other man, surrounded by light, in front of the truck, was this some dream, Estella? No. He was standing by the truck. My father and I looked at each other kind of puzzled and possibly looking at her as if she may have dreamt something within the time of she was in the hospital. Oh. But Estella insisted she had not been dreaming. The story she tells is truly astonishing. All I remember is looking at the truck coming so fast, and just with all my heart, I said to God, God, please don't let me die. 
And then I started reciting psalms that I know. I said, the angel of the Lord uh, takes care of those that love him. And then I look again, and the truck is right in front of me, and I could see the robber's face. He looked so angry. You could see those eyes. He was desperate. I look again, and now, in front of the truck, there is this beautiful person. He looks so peaceful, so beautiful. He has the most beautiful smile. You could see him like in slow motion. Immediately, I forgot about the ice cream truck. I forgot about everything that was happening. All I remember was this beautiful face, and then I grabbed his hand. I put my face over his hand, and I would go like this. And I remember a couple of times I opened my eyes to look at his face to be sure that he was there. And I could see him right over here looking at me with a big smile. I believed her. She was very sincere, very excited, very sure of the fact that she, the angel was there. Um, I felt possibly a little doubtful myself because nobody else saw anything. But uh, you can see it in her eyes that it was true. I cannot really explain this beautiful experience. I have no doubt in my heart that God sent an angel to save me. I ask everyone if they saw this beautiful person pulling me to the side and helping me. Nobody knew what I was talking about. But I knew that it was true that God sent an angel to save me. Remarkably, Estella Vera feels no bitterness about the accident. And with the aid of a prosthesis, Estella has already been able to walk again. Are there angels among us? No matter what anyone else may think, Estella Vera firmly believes she is alive today because she was visited by a guardian angel. When we return, a woman fighting a deadly disease needs your help to find her long lost sister. And police believe a mystery witness holds the key to identifying a cold-blooded killer. For Diane Hanline of La Crescenta, California, every day is a race against time. The rare and often fatal blood disease she has been fighting since 1986 has finally reached the crisis point. Hello, Diane. How are you doing? Hi, Doc. This procedure is going to take about five or ten minutes. You may be a little uncomfortable uh, before the biopsy is done. How uncomfortable? It's going to hurt, but it won't take long. Diane has a relatively unusual blood disorder, normally uh, considered to be an incurable illness now potentially could be cured by the utilization of a bone marrow transplantation. Fraught with a lot of dangers, though, a lot of potential complications, so not, not something to be taken lightly. In all the world, this woman, Diane's younger sister, Marilyn, is the only potential bone marrow donor who offers any chance of success. But Diane has no idea where Marilyn is today. She hasn't even talked to her sister in more than 20 years. I feel I'm asking a lot of my sister to do this bone marrow for me. But even if she doesn't agree to a transplant, if she doesn't say, I don't want to do this, I would still like to make peace with her. She's my sister. Diane is three years older than Marilyn. They grew up in Los Angeles during the 1940s. We were post-war babies, and we came from a lot of poverty. There wasn't any money. And our mother and father had to work, you know, a lot of long hours. We were like most children. We fought and bickered and didn't want to do the housework. You know, you do that, no, you do that. And I don't think it hurt us, but I think that it, she resented that. 
Come on, baby, let's go. Okay. Diane and Marilyn's parents separated in 1954. Everything I told you? Yeah. Ready? I'm ready. Ultimately, Marilyn went to live with her father. Bye. Bye. After my sister moved in with my dad, I saw my sister maybe like once a month. But as time went on, it became more infrequent. And um, I just think because she went with dad and I went with mom that we, we separated. I mean, we just lost our, we didn't do our activities or anything together anymore. Years passed with little contact. In 1965, Diane visited her sister at the restaurant where she worked. This place never stops. Tits are okay, though. So how you doing? Well, met a new guy. Yeah? Yes. Marilyn said she was in love. She planned to marry a man who had several children from a previous marriage. That's great. Yeah. Crazy about him. Neither sister realized the brief visit would be the last time they would see each other face to face. Eight years later, they did speak briefly on the phone. Michael. Marilyn told Diane that she had a little boy named Billy Joe. Billy Joe? It's good. The sisters talked about getting together, but time drifted by and they never spoke again. Bye. Bye-bye. In January of 1994, Diane hired private investigator Marilyn Gunnell to find her sister. Well, it's like a needle in a haystack, because without a name, you have nothing to pin your investigation on. Um, we have tried certain things with the use of her maiden name and her first married name. And of course, her maiden name is Jones, which makes it extremely difficult. There is no paucity of Jones available. Hello, how are you? Fine, how are you, doctor? Pretty good. With every passing day, Diane's treatments become less and less effective. Yes. Her search, morning, more and more vital. In the morning. Mm -hmm. Any bleeding, easy bruising? I'm having more bruising now. Mm. Diane is a, an unusual yes, person. She has a very strong will. She's very optimistic. She's really, so to speak, already beaten the odds by getting this far. I think I'm still here after all these years is because I don't think that my life should be over with yet. You know, I have a, I had a daughter to finish raising, to go to college, and I'd like to see her get married and have babies, and I just don't feel like checking out of here yet, but I think I'm going to pretty soon <laughs> if I don't do something fast. When we broadcast Diane's story, a private investigator from Denver, Colorado, Robin Lee, was watching. She was touched by Diane's plight, but assumed we would get the clues we needed. We didn't. As luck would have it, Robin was also watching when the segment reran in June. This time, she decided to volunteer her help in tracking Marilyn down. The result was one of our most unusual solves ever. I contacted the show, got a little more information. Um, started out with the sister's name. Marilyn Jones was her maiden name. Started with that and a date of birth and went on from there. And it took me about three days to find her, three working days, if you don't count the 4th of July holiday in between. Um, and I think it's great that they're back together. On August 13th, 1994, Marilyn and Diane met face to face for the first time in 30 years. <laughs> it's so good to see you. <laughs> Once we hugged, it was like, it hadn't been 30 years. It had been, you know, just a short time. I, I guess maybe that's why I feel comfortable is because I can feel the love. And when you feel that love, you feel comfortable. You, over. you haven't changed a bit. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I get cuter with age. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. I think I'm still in shock. You know, it's still like I, you know, I'm not here yet. It's just, it's just a dream, you know. But it's, it's a great dream, and we have a lot of catching up to do. And I, will be together forever now. We're gonna have a lot of fun together. Enjoy the time we have. Isn't that beautiful? Coincidentally, the day of the reunion was Diane's 53rd birthday, and Marilyn had not forgotten. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a big thing. Yeah. This is the best gift I've ever had in my whole life. This is the best gift ever, is to have my sister and to have my family for my birthday. It'll be the best birthday I've ever had in my whole life. <laughs> We drive 60 miles to go to... On the day of the reunion, Marilla's fondest wish was to prove a compatible bone marrow donor for her sister. I know, where do you drive to go to the movies? Oh, to the movies, we have to go all the way to Canada. And that's, that's, that's the closest I want one. more than anything to have this work with Diane. But even if it doesn't, we're going to take full advantage of however long we do have together. We can make a week seem like an eternity. As it turned out, a series of tests showed Marilyn's bone marrow would not work for Diane. But there is a ray of hope. Doctors are now moving on to a new experimental therapy for Diane's blood disorder. In the meantime, she and Marilyn are making the most of their precious, newly kindled relationship. January 24th, 1987, a deputy sheriff named Charlie Anderson was gunned down in his Burbank, California home. The next day, an anonymous witness phoned the Burbank police, claiming to know the identity of the killer. But the caller, obviously nervous, hung up before revealing any information. He never called back. Authorities hope that tonight, seven years later, this mystery witness will finally come forward and solve the murder of Charlie Anderson. Charlie Anderson was a 14-year veteran of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. He distinguished himself as a highly skilled driver, teaching hundreds of officers how to handle themselves and their vehicles in dangerous situations. Charlie was probably one of the most talented drivers that I've ever met. It was a natural talent for him. Charlie was able to get along with everybody. He um, was serious on the job, but he had a good sense of humor when he was around uh, the rest of the staff. By all accounts, Charlie Anderson was also a dedicated father, never too busy to spend evenings and weekends with his two sons. Charlie didn't seem to have an enemy in the world until the early hours of January 24th, 1987. Charlie's wife, Beth, told police that around midnight, she, Charlie, and their two young sons returned home from a visit to her parents. Oh, honey, he's out like a light. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and bring him upstairs, and uh, then I'll come back for you and the baby. OK, thanks. They arrived home, and because Mrs. Anderson was suffering from a back injury, uh, her husband offered to go inside the house with her oldest boy first. Uh, he asked her to wait in the car, and she did so. Charlie Anderson went in the house uh, with the oldest son, and we believe took him upstairs. A few moments later, Mrs. Anderson heard what sounded like backfires from where she was parked in the driveway. She was still seated in the car. Because the sound was unusual, she walked to the house and called in to see if there was anything wrong. Downstairs, picked up her younger son and ran to a next door neighbor's house. Help! Help! Initially, the detectives believed that it was the house was being burglarized and that Mr. Anderson had interrupted the burglary and had confronted the suspects. One of the things that was not consistent with the burglary was the suspect had very carefully moved items 
Normally in a burglary, the suspects or the burglars are working very quickly. They'll pull out a drawer and dump the entire drawer just to examine all the contents at once. What the investigators found was that the drawers had been either pulled out partially or carefully pulled out and maybe one item removed. And when they felt that that was inconsistent with most burglary scenes that they had seen. There were other telltale signs that the burglary had been staged. While they had selected certain items and placed them together to be taken from the house, they had overlooked other items that were much more valuable that were in plain sight. This led to a second theory that this might have been someone that perhaps knew Deputy Anderson that confronted him and shot him. Charlie's sister, Trish, believes that is exactly what happened. She was at the scene that night, called by a neighbor. But what really surprised me was the look on his face. He had a look, um, a wide-eyed look, as if he'd been shocked or betrayed. It's something that um, lingers with me today. Was Charlie Anderson ambushed by someone he knew? Someone who dressed up a cold-blooded murder to look like a random burglary gone wrong. In the end, evidence at the crime scene was ambiguous. The only identifiable fingerprints were all from members of the family. Police were left with a murder victim and virtually no leads until the mysterious phone call one day later. What you were about to hear is a reenactment of that conversation taken directly from police transcripts. Burbank Police Department, may I help you? Uh, yes, may I speak to the officer in charge, please? Uh, sure, we're regarding what type of incident? This is some information that might lead to the killer that uh, shot the deputy sheriff. OK, wait a minute, hang on just a second. At that time, the investigator handling the case was in the station, and he was called to the dispatch area so he could speak with the person that had called in. I know who did the shooting. OK, the watch commander's on his way down here to answer the phone, OK? I can't wait too long. OK, here's the detective handling the case right now. Hang on just a second. Hi there. What can I do for you? Is this being recorded? Yes, it is. I, I can't speak to you if this is recorded. OK, why don't I give you the number of my office where it is not recorded? I'm not going to lie to you, OK? I don't like recordings. The man on the line okay. was very, very nervous. He was very concerned about his That's voice being taped about him being, the call being traced, or in any way, the police identifying who he was. I'm not playing around. The well, call could not be routed to an unrecorded line. The detective had to ask the witness to hang up and call again. OK, well, as I said, you're going to have to give me about two minutes to get back to my office. All right. OK. The man readily agreed. Bye -bye. But the phone call never came. On January 31st, 1987, Charlie Anderson was laid to rest with the full honors reserved for officers killed in the line of duty. Since then, lack of evidence has dragged the investigation to a standstill. Seven years after the murder of Charlie Anderson, authorities are still searching for the unidentified caller. We feel it's very, very important to locate this caller because he was concerned enough to call us right at the beginning of the investigation. He has never been identified, and we're very, very interested in speaking to him to find out what he does know about this case. Next. A woman's search for her birth parents draws her into the exotic world of the traveling carnival. For most of us, a night at the carnival offers thrills, chills, and an old-fashioned good time. But for Brenda Abbey, a 45-year-old mother of three from Chester, Virginia, this frenzied magic promises much more, the solution to her own personal unsolved mystery. Okay. When's your birthday? Brenda was adopted as an infant. 
She knows little about her biological parents except their names and that they worked for the Setlin and Wilson Traveling Carnival almost 50 years ago. Every time I hear over the news that there's a carnival, I will go. And I go up to every booth, every concession. I go up to every person that's employed by that carnival and I look at them just to see if I can find somebody that looks like me. In April of 1949, Brenda was adopted by Sulin and Thelma Zemer of Petersburg, Virginia. When she was 16, Brenda found out that her birth parents had been with the Setlin and Wilson Carnival. In 1983, Brenda developed a serious health problem. Because of her acute need for a family medical history, Virginia officials released a copy of Brenda's birth certificate. Her biological parents were Elizabeth Hansen and Walter Dean Perry. Brenda was stunned to learn she had two siblings. But for Brenda's search, the most important clue was her birth father's occupation. My father was a representative of the Midget Review. Possibly my father was a barker, where he goes out there and he tries to get people to come in to see the midgets in their show. Tonight you're going to regret it tomorrow. This show stars. The pieces of the puzzle were falling into place. Brenda set out to find everything she could on the Setlin and Wilson Carnival. I looked in the newspapers back in 1948, and I did come across the announcements of Setlin and Wilson and I found a group of midgets that were called Singer's Midgets. And I know the whole library heard me because I said, I found them, I found them. Finally, Brenda Abbey had a tangible clue and that led straight to the carnival circuit. Last month, we joined Brenda in Virginia to experience her search firsthand. The excitement of each promising lead and the heartache of near misses and dead ends. Brenda visits every carnival that passes within 200 miles of her hometown. Are they with the carnival? Nope. No. Nobody is but me. I'm the black sheep. Old timers like Joe Stevenson, a 60 year veteran of the carnival, offer rare glimpses into a strange and exotic world. That's right. Uh, do you happen to remember if this woman had been pregnant at the time? We made up a language. Like just vowels switched around. Like you got here, light, Leah's light. Kia's camera, camera, Joe, G O, G is O. I could say, Leah Zook is that, Leah is that, me is Ann. You don't know what I'm speaking. I said, look at that man. We're speaking what is known as Connie. Well, I worked as, uh, sometimes as the alligator girl. I worked as the world's strangest mother. And I had to go up on a stage and talk to the public. A lot of them had to live in wagons and underneath wagons and things like that in the old days. They don't do that today, but they used to have to do it because they didn't make enough. Hopefully, I'm going to ring a bell one day with one of these people, and they're going to know my parents uh, simply by what I tell them about the midget review. They might remember somebody. But uh, this is what I do. I keep hoping that somebody in the carnival that's old enough to remember will remember. They're the original singer midgets. Yeah. Because here's yeah. Carl. Yeah. I remember him. He was the tuba player in the band. Yeah. They had the yeah. smallest little midget in the world. What was her name, remember? They no. never bought out on the front. You paid that extra yep. on the dance She's show. right that, there. That was Margie. Yeah. Margie. Yep, Margie. Margie. Got it. That's, that's it. Yeah. This is the group I was telling you about that had to cook. Uh-huh. And she remembered the lady's name like I do, but the only thing we know. For a brief oh, instant, right. Brenda thought Joe and the others had actually known her birth that mother. That happens a lot, you know. Well, and, and it, it, was she 20, 24? No, Mama was she was young? a settled woman then, wasn't she? She was just an old lady. He mother. doesn't feel that she could have been my mother because her age would have made her, he said, he was just joking, he said 2,000 years old by now. So it definitely could not have been my mother. My mother was supposedly 24 when she had me. So, but Joe said that quite possibly it might be Mama Lee's daughter. But there again, who knows, and it's another avenue I'll have to travel. When 
it was a singer's. Let me ask you first, what year were you born that that would have been on the first? Okay, 1949. Brenda did uncover one exciting lead, the phone number for a man named Ward Hall, a prominent booking agent for East Coast Carnival sideshows. We were there when Brenda called him. Uh-huh. Ward Hall knew Carnival people going back some 50 years, but he had never heard of Brenda's birth parents. I really thought he was my answer. I really did. I had a lot of faith in that phone call, and I'm a little disappointed. I really am. Not because he couldn't give me the answer I wanted, but just because he didn't have it. We're going over to the uh, Department of Social Services uh, in Richmond, and over there they have uh, identifying information. The just before we traveled to Virginia, a judge had granted Brenda access to her sealed adoption papers. We were not allowed to film in the archives, but our cameras were on hand when Brenda emerged. The documents finally revealed where her birth parents had gone after the adoption. I got it. Alaska. And it's all the identifying information filled in. Everything. And there's two different names. I've got a W.L. Perry, and then I have a W.D. Perry. They said it could be a typographical error, but maybe not. They're just not sure. Despite the information in the adoption records, it turns out that the Setlin and Wilson Carnival never once traveled to Alaska. Nor has Brenda found any evidence that her biological parents moved to Alaska on their own. Perhaps the next carnival will yield the clue that finally leads Brenda to her birth parents. I want to find my parents and my siblings more than anything in the world. I want to tell my mother before she dies, I don't think she did anything wrong. I think she did what she had to do. And I really can understand it. I have a heart big enough to understand that. Update. During a search that spanned 30 years, Brenda talked with countless old timers. Are they with the carnival? Nope. No. Uh, Each had a story to tell, and some even offered suggestions. But not one claimed to know Elizabeth Hansen or Walter Perry. Inevitably, as each carnival was packing up and hitting the road, Brenda Abbey was left behind, no closer to finding her birth parents. It seemed she might finally be out of options until the night of our broadcast. The response was far greater than even Brenda had hoped for. Not only did her birth mother call our phone center, but so did a sister and a brother, then another sister. Additional calls were logged in from friends of still more siblings. Brenda Abbey was saddened to learn that her birth father had died in 1959, but she was thrilled to discover a total of 11 brothers and sisters. One of them, Martha Oak of St. Clair Shores, Michigan, hosted a reunion in August of 1994. Although Brenda's birth mother was unable to attend, Brenda finally met four of her long lost brothers and sisters face to face. As hostess for the celebration, Martha was the first to welcome Brenda. Hi, Brenda. <laughs> How are you doing? A brother, Thomas Chillog, flew in from Louisiana, 1,000 miles away. <laughs> Another sister, Susan Donner, came in from Port Clinton, Ohio. Brenda's brother, Frank Smith, grew up in Greenwood, Mississippi. Like Brenda, he never imagined he had so many siblings. I did my own search uh, and kept running into dead ends and finally gave up. And uh, when I found out about this, it was incredible. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. Totally unbelievable. 
It's funny to actually walk up to people and touch their skin and know that they're related. The get-together in Michigan promises to be just the first of many. And, and Bill said, Bill said. Plans are already underway for the next reunion. These are my flesh and blood, and it's something nobody can take away from me. That's right. And it, it's such a great feeling. It's worth the search. It was worth the 30 years that it took me to do this. In just a few weeks, an exciting new season of Unsolved Mysteries will begin. Here's a sample. In the late 1960s, thousands of curiosity seekers flocked to see the Iceman. Was it a hoax, or perhaps a prehistoric cousin of man? Novelist Agatha Christie was a queen of mystery, but how many of us know that in 1926, Agatha took center stage in her own real life mystery? 21-year-old Tommy Burkett died in 1991, an apparent suicide. Now his parents have pieced together a shocking scenario of murder and intrigue. From the realm of the unexplained, a bolt of lightning sends a young man on an incredible journey to the brink of death and back. And follow a team of real-life Ghostbusters as they track down an elusive spirit at a haunted hotel in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Join me starting later in September for four special Sunday broadcasts and then in October during our new time period, Fridays at 8. Thank you.